from HanselMinutes.com, it's Hansel Minutes, a weekly discussion with web developer and technologist Scott Hanselman, hosted by Carl Franklin. This is Lawrence Ryan announcing show number 136, recorded live Wednesday, October 29th, 2008. Support for Hansel Minutes is provided by Telerik, RAD Controls, the most comprehensive suite of components for Windows Forms and ASP.NET web applications. Online at www.telerik.com. And by .NET Developers Journal, the world's leading .NET developer magazine. Online at www.sys-con.com. In this episode, Scott talks with each team at the Microsoft Research Section at this year's Professional Developers Conference in Los Angeles. Hi, this is Scott Hanselman, and this is another episode of Hansel Minutes, and I'm here at Microsoft PDC 2008 in Los Angeles. I just happen to be wandering around by myself here at the Microsoft Research booth, what they're calling MSR at PDC. I'm just going to wander around from booth to booth and see what folks at Microsoft Research are working on. So hi, so what am I looking at here, sir? Scott, you are looking at Microsoft Research Auto Collage. This is an application that came directly from research to a product. One of our researchers a while ago came up with this idea of creating an automatic collage of a photo collection. Okay, so I'm looking here. I'm sitting here with Alison Sol, a development manager with Microsoft Research, and I'm looking at pictures of people's faces kind of organized in a really attractive uh, collage, but not just a collage where pictures have been thrown up against a window, but it's, it's nice and square. There's fades between pictures, and I notice that everyone's face is visible in this, uh, this collage. Exactly. So this paper... It was published two years ago for the SIGGRAPH, which is the most important conference in computer graphics. And it has all the details of how to create a collage automatically. You point to a folder and you get those images through those equations and it will come up with a collage automatically for you. We saw this as a very good technology that had the potential of being integrated into some Microsoft product, or, as it was this particular case, we would bring this to market directly. Okay, so this is a paper that was published, it looks like it's SIGGRAPH 06. I've been to SIGGRAPH a number of times. It's really the most important computer graphics symposium and uh, conference that there is. And I'm looking at an application which kind of looks like a a Windows Live Gallery, and it's sucking images out of a directory. We've got images of ducks and candles and uh, and people and places. And uh, you're browsing those images, and right now they're just kind of scattered uh, uh, on 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 a palette. This is a scatter view. So our application wants to give you exactly the idea that you got those pictures in a folder, you throw them away randomly, and now you want to create a collage. All that you need to tell us is how many images you want in this collage, from 7 to 25, and then you press the Create button. Okay, so he's got 25 images in his collage here, and he's pulled a slider bar, and now they're kind of the, the images are dancing around the screen, and kind of almost like Tetris, they're finding the right place. It doesn't look like they were going to make a perfect square, but then they did, and they, uh, they came together into a collage of seven images, all with nice blur effects. Now, how did it... How did it know to keep that castle in frame and that door in frame? Why did it, why did it not clip that incorrectly? Exactly. Auto collage, the technology behind this, if you look back at the or, or, origin of this technology, it tries to address four problems. One, given a large set of images, how to select a smaller set that represents that larger set. So it has to recognize that these are images that are similar in some way, that's representative of a set. Yes. Then, for each one of these images, it will select a region of interest that has to be in the final collage. So it looks like from the, from the paper here, which is written from the point of view of a PhD, uh, this image has to be substan- substantial, something significant that you would look at. When you see this image, it's representative of that image. Like, So now... Each of those inner images that you want to place in the collage, they have to go to a position in the collage that allows that region of interest to appear, yet it allows some overlap to the next image. 
So it has to have enough of a margin where it doesn't lose the region of interest, but still looks right when put next to the next the next image. And finally, we have to blend together those so that the transition from one image to the next one is a smooth transition and not just something that you can easily see that that image started here and the next one was ending in the final collage. Now, I've seen these collages being built over the last several minutes, and it never seems to get one wrong. They always look nice. Is there some? Uh, what are some image examples of images that would confuse the algorithm and would would look bad? Like if you took, uh, uh, I don't know, an image, two images together that were of uh, maybe one of people and one of, I don't know, insects. Would it cause them to to create an un an unattractive collage? Can you fool this system? Indeed, the only images that we have that really created collage that were not nice are images that are not pictures, are images that we created manually, like, for example, if you have an image that is some color, some single color, uh, one single digital image that is the blue color, another one that is the red color, that will not create a nice collage. The application will not never find nice borders and nice ways to make a transition from one image to the next. Ah, so abstract and artificially created images. But images of the real world typically have something that's coherent and uh, you're trying to take a picture of something. So, I wonder if you took pictures of clouds and tried to do that, if you would confuse the system. No, because see, clouds... Even though you don't see those very clearly, they have variations of the tone of this uh, cloud uh, color. So that is something that the algorithm will consider and it will use that to make the transition as smooth as possible. The only way that we really found that can create a very ugly collage is if you digitally create an image that has a single color, and then you try to create a collage of single colors. Now, we're looking at a picture, uh, we're looking at uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven pictures of people, and one of them is a picture of you with a wax Albert Einstein. And uh, I noticed that when it was creating the collage, it definitely thought that was a person. It put a, it put a square over his face. So this knows not just about significant images, but if there's a face there, it really tries hard to make sure that it might cut off your body, but it keeps the face. Exactly. We are using a very good technology from Microsoft Research for face detection. About 70% of the faces that are looking at the camera, we detect perfectly. So it's very hard for you to miss a face, but the application still allows you if, for example, here we are looking at a picture with two faces. Let's assume one of those were, was not detected. You could manually come here and say, oh, this is the entire area with faces in this image, and then the application would consider that and not have any of those faces cut in the final collage. So you're using the facial recognition technology as a, uh, a weighted hint to uh, say this is a significant area of interest. Now, I suppose I could lie. Let's say that uh, this picture of this couple uh, is them getting married, and I want to mark his, her hand because it has an, a wedding ring. Exactly. What you just said is exactly what some of our users are uh, applying this manual face detection for. And it is very interesting because most of our customers that use this, they use for animals. People that like cats and dogs. Of course, we don't have uh, cat face detection technology yet. But what they do is they come here and if they have, for example, a a cat or a dog in the picture, they come and define that as a face area and the entire face of the cat or dog appears in the final collage. Fantastic. Now, people can see this at research.microsoft.com slash autocollage, and I'll put a link to that in the show notes. Is this something that people can download right now or they can only see videos of it happening? They can download right now. It works for Windows XP and Windows Vista, and it only requires .NET 3.0 because we are using WPF for the using interface. Fantastic. Thank you. Alison So, Development Manager at Microsoft Research in Cambridge. Thanks a lot. We're wandering around at PDC. I'm at Microsoft Research at PDC, or what they're calling MSR at PDC. 
and I'm with uh, Christian Kunig, a researcher at uh, Microsoft in Redmond. And uh, what have we got for me here today? What, uh, what are you working on? So this project is called Blues, and it's for all, all intents and purposes, it's a newsreader. The distinguishing features to all other news aggregation sites is that it allows you to look at news in context. What I mean by that is it allows you to surface news, and at the same time, for every article you happen to be interested in, you also get all the blog commentary that we were able to, um, to crawl for that specific article. So, for example, here we have broken down the commentary into liberal and conservative bloggers. And what I'm surfacing here right now is an article on Troopergate. And if we drill down, we see that there were three conservative bloggers who have commented on this, and not surprisingly, 15 liberal ones. Now, for each of these comments, I can actually click on them and surface the blog post as well. Okay, so how did you know that those bloggers were conservative, these three? Did you manually do that and look at it as a human and say, we have identified this as a right blog? It's a very good question. We actually stayed away from that. So there are two sources of information. There are either some bloggers who self-identify, and in addition, there are some pre-existing lists that um, classify bloggers into conservative and liberals. Um, however, we stayed away from making that judgment ourselves. Okay. So that information, though, comes from, from other humans who are not us. There's no computer system that decided that they were left or right. That's correct. And it's an input to our system. It's not something that we are in, um, dealing with in any way. Okay. So we're looking at an, a an application that has blue on the left and red on the right. We've got a bar chart that's showing off to uh, the left, indicating that, for example, uh, 15 bloggers with a large blue bar uh, were liberal or left-leaning and had a comment on Troopergate. And I assume that you identified those because they linked to that, that story. That's correct. So then the input is the story the number of blogs that link to it, and then the whether or not that blog was left or right. Um, correct again. And we actually create all of that input by crawling the web and having a continuous blog stream that feeds into our system, which we then clean. We find duplicate news articles because a lot of AP stories get published on different news sites. So we, um, we clean those up. We figure out which are the duplicates. We aggregate all the links and then have a server um, which is accessed by this sh um, small visual client that you see here. So the bar charts make it clear whether uh, uh, liberals or conservatives are particularly interested in that story. For example, there's one from the Washington Post that indicates that Palin makes a pit bull look tame. And interestingly, there are 21 reactions from the liberal side, probably jumping on that and saying that that's important to them, while only one conservative. But there's also a little uh, gray box, and there's some different colored boxes, gray boxes, orange, uh, yellow boxes, and then the, either one, two, or three. What data is that uh, indicating to me? So the final piece of this puzzle is the fact that we try to look into the emotional charge in the discussion, where you have a scale from going to pure, from pure statements of fact, things like the Fed raised interest rates by a point today, to things that are highly emotionally charged, um, something like, this is an outrage, how could they do that? And we try to give for any set of blog comments an indicator that tells us how charged um, this discussion has been. And is, this is visualized as small glowing boxes on the side. The more boxes and the more the glow around it, the more charge in the discussion. So one of these stories here from the New York Post is indicating that a uh, Domino's pizza worker has been hounded by community activist groups. On the liberal side, it indicates uh, that there are three boxes, so that liberal blogger has said something that's very emotionally charged, while on the right-hand side, there have been eight conservative reactions. There's only one box. That's indicating that they're speaking just the facts. Is that correct? Um, I'm not sure if it's just factual, but the language is very neutral. It's not charged at all. So it may be inflammatory language, but it's not using highly charged, emotionally uh, loaded language. Yes, exactly. Now, where do you see this going? We're in an emotionally charged time and we have the election available to us, but how do you see this research going into the, the future? So there's, there's two, two pieces of this puzzle. The, the one thing is that we, we enable two things that a user can do. One is just seeing the news in context. The other is actually prioritizing what they want to read. So I can ask questions now like, what are conservatives talking about? What are liberals talking about? What have been the interesting stories in the past? There's a keyword search engine integrated here. So for all intents and purposes, it allows you to focus your news reading to what you, whatever you happen to be interested in. The, the other piece of the story is the fact that 
Unlike this demo here, this of course generalizes easily beyond just the political domain. So you could imagine this going for financial news, for product reviews, for sports news, and also for different ways of splitting, um, of sort of chopping down the blogosphere. Right now we just split into liberal and conservative bloggers, but it could be anything. You could imagine a breakdown into location, gender, um, special interests, um, affiliation with certain sports teams, affiliation with certain employers, etc. Now, from your chart here and all the glowing boxes, if I indicated that I was interested only in, in reading uh, news that is not emotionally charged, it looks like I would have nothing to read. Um, no, actually, that's not quite true. But in the political domain, it's, it tends to be rare, very rare. Um, I, wish, I wish we had more factual information, but it doesn't really look like that right now. Yeah, from your chart, there's virtually nothing that is not uh, at least contains some emotionally charged language. Are you using that as just English keyword searches to say that uh, what's an example of something emotionally charged that would uh, cause one of these glowing boxes to appear? So what we started out with is actually have um, we had humans label um, hundreds of blog posts. First, we d tested if humans agree in their judgments, which turned out to be roughly true. And then we trained up a machine learning based classifier to figure out how well does this classifier emulate the human judgments. And the classifier gets things in quotes right about 80% of the time and it indeed uses keywords in combination of keywords. So we use one grams, two grams and th three grams. And this enables us, us to differentiate between things like good, not good, and not very good, which are all very different shades of gray. And um, so, so having more words and context makes the, uh, makes the classifier smarter. Now, the source information, that, from my point of view, appears to be news. So all of these are blog reactions on news items. You don't have any opinion items and then opinions on those, reactions on those. Is, is the intent here to show uh, factual information as the baseline source and then opinion on those? Or are the, other option, are the other things that you're looking at liberal news and conservative news? I'm trying to understand if this is simply opinions about facts or opinions about opinions. The, the, the prime motivation was when we started all of this was actually to look into, to get a sense of how news is received. Now, the problem with any sort of news site and even a lot of the commentary is that people try to write in a, at least on the surface, very objective way, which frustrates any pure machine-based attempts to find any spin, find any sentiment. So based on that, we looked into the context of news to, to see if that gives us a better handle on how news is received, who likes what news, and if there potentially is either a spin or a drift in, in these things. Now, this, the, the whole notion of spin is not something we surface. We try to make everything as transparent as possible. So what we surface are only things like how many bloggers from which camp have linked to something and allow people to draw their own conclusions. Yet at the same time, it turns out that for any newspaper article, the context actually carries a lot of information that you would miss if you purely read the news. Now, if an article was, was ultimately really quite neutral, uh, one of these uh, things that might be marked, for example, as liberal, but the comments on the same page were highly emotionally charged, how do you deal with that? Are comments an additional and separately uh, segmented bit of information? Because I might be interested in neutral reporting with very, very liberal comments, for example. Right. And right now, the emotional charge only refers to the comments, not the news at all. So we do differentiate between that and what you could see if you had the UI is sort of when you click on um, the comment section for any individual article, you get um, the location of the blog or you typically get the title of the blog. So you, you get a very nice overview to start to begin with of what people have been saying and then you, and then you have the ability to drill down. What about the additional drilling, the additional layer of the comments of the readers of this particular blog? So here's a news article. Here's one blogger who is, quote unquote, commenting on that. But they may have a very active comment board. That feels like that's an additional kind of axis of information. It appears to me that you are basing uh, this person's very emotionally charged blog entry on, I assume, the text that appears on the permalink of the page that you crawled. You have no way of distinguishing between the story itself and the comments that appear below the fold. Right. That's, that's completely right. Right now, we are, for all intents and purposes, ignoring the commentary. Um, that is something that's in the making and we hope to add at some point in the future, but it's not being surfaced yet. Interesting. So what do you plan on doing with this technology? The, the, the most important thing is sort of finding the right sweet spots to surface this. 
Um, this is available to anyone within Microsoft. So all you have to do in order to try this out is to go to MSW, search for Blues, spelled B-L-E-W-S. And the first page that'll come up is the Blues page with details, project members, and a nice link that, once you click on it, will actually give you um, the user interface that we're looking at right now. So that'll let me, as an internal Microsoft employee, do that. Is there any, any idea of putting this on research.microsoft.com and showing it to the public at some point? Um, potentially, yes. However, there's already something that's available outside already, too. And that's called the Social Streams Project. So if you go to socialstreams.livelabs.com... And I'll put links to that in the show notes for everyone to see. Um, what you get is a portal that has been built by the social media team in Live Labs, who we've collaborated with and which incorporates a small pieces of code from the Blues code base as well. And it gives you the same browsing experience in the sense that I can browse for news, I can browse for blogs, I can browse for people. And whatever I'm, fo I'm focusing on, I can now drill down into related blogs, related news at any point in time. It's being continuously updated, so it follows the news 24-7. It just launched, I think, two weeks ago, maybe three weeks ago. So it's just gearing up and it has significant users already. Cool. Well, thank you so much, Christian Koenig, the researcher with Microsoft Research, uh, for talking to me here at PDC. Thank you. Hi, this is Scott Hanselman with a word from our sponsor. Do you know how to build Web 2.0 AJAX applications with Web 1.0 components? You really can't. If you want to do the next-generation web applications, you'll need next-generation components, just like the ones that our friends at Telerik have got. They're rad controls for ASP.NET AJAX. It's a huge pack of web controls built on top of ASP.NET AJAX that'll add previously impossible performance and interactivity to your next project. The new controls mirror the AJAX API from ASP.NET, so development is really straightforward. The client scripts are shared, so loading time is not a problem. You just set a couple of properties, and you'll be able to automatically bind to web services for a really efficient operation. The new RAD editor from ASP.NET AJAX Telerik loads up to four times faster than before, and the new RAD grid handles thousands of records in just milliseconds. But... As always, it's best to try for yourself. So you can visit Telerik.com slash ASP.NET AJAX and download a trial. Thanks a lot. So I'm continuing to wander around the Microsoft Research boot here at PDC, and I'm at MSR at PDC. I just stumbled upon Andrew Bagel, a research at, researcher at Microsoft uh, Research, and he's got a thing that says Deep IntelliSense. I love IntelliSense. It must be better if it's deep. Uh, Andrew, what have you got to show me today? Well, uh, for Deep IntelliSense is a way to, for developers and testers to look at their code when something has happened to their code, but they weren't looking. So what we have inside Deep IntelliSense is a way to mine the repositories of your version control system, of your uh, bug database, of your discussion forums, of your Outlook messages or email mailing list, and try to find out anything that might be related to the source code that you're looking at in your, in your editor. So I'm looking at a Visual Studio instance here up on your big screen, and you've got some toolboxes on the right that say current item, related people, event history, and it's got all sorts of information. It looks like some, some calendar items, some tasks, some email. You've got uh, some bugs, and you know, you're pulling this information from all over. Yes. So basically, for people who are doing investigations like developers, when they're trying to understand the rationale behind bugs, What they need to do is to look at all the places that they can find information that where somebody might have been talking about a particular piece of code that they're probably unfamiliar with. So often you debug your way into somebody else's code, and you want to know, how did it get this way? Because it's causing a problem in my code. So what they do is they look at, usually developers tell us they look at the most recent check-in, and they say, well, let's, let me look at the diff between the previous one and the current one, and I can find out what exactly happened. Okay. And it's the same kind of thing over and over. It's like, okay, here's some code I haven't seen. Let's push the blame button. Who did that code? What do I know about that guy? I and mean, we're doing all of this rote work ourselves. Let's open up Outlook. Let's do a search. I'm hearing you say you're doing all of that for us. Yeah, exactly. So, And even worse, they're often going into their version control system. They find that there's a check-in on a particular date made by a particular person, and there's no way to correlate that with stuff that comes from the bug database. Often what they'll do is they'll do the search for the same date, same time, and try to see if somebody edited a bug or a work item that the check-in that they think is potentially fixing. So what is your input into this? Is it the project plus the file name and the line number, or at what level of granularity are we looking at these, uh, uh, this bit of deep information? So the information granularity is really on the uh, class, method, field, and property boundary. So we're actually parsing the source code 
uh, both on the back end when we crawl uh, these repositories and we form, we put all the data we have into a big database. And whenever you're roaming around the code inside Visual Studio, you click on a function or click on a method um, or click on a field. We'll, we look up the qualified name of what we find inside our database and we take a look at all the different bugs and check-ins that we found um, that are related to it, that we've discovered are related to it. Now, is this information going to change as I move around this file? On a, on a, can you show me that? You're going to move around on a method-by-method method basis here. So if I scroll up here, we can click on uh, blog-enabled method, and then the, the, the views on the right change to show me that blog-enabled had two check-ins between November of last year and August of this year, and that the check-ins happened by this guy, the kid, who turns out to be the, most, uh, the owner of the code because he's got all the commits. Interesting. So, and, and looking on the right-hand side here, we've got a number of uh, bits of information that are hyperlinked. So the kid, who is the username of the person who worked on this particular property, is hyperlinked. If I, if I click on him, do I get to IM him, or what do I see if I learn about the kid? If you click on the kid, you can send him an email message uh, through Codeplex.com. So the source code we're looking at actually comes from Codeplex.com, uh, which uses a Team Foundation server back end. So the, most of the information is coming from Team Foundation server, but Codeplex has an additional information about people and about uh, discussion forum messages, which happen on the website. Now, do you have just specific projects that you set up here to do? Can you check out my CodePlex projects and see information, or have you pre pre primed the pump here? We're pre priming the pump. We have a client server solution, so the server is let loose on your source code repository, and then crawls everything. takes uh, a few hours, and then you point your Visual Studio client at that uh, SQL Server backend and to get all the data that you want. You know, whenever I look at Microsoft Research stuff, I always feel like I'm seeing a preview of some product in, like, you know, 2020. This feels like this might be, you know, VSTS 2020. This is a really taking collaboration to the next level. Is the goal to somehow push this into a product someday? Uh, that would be a nice goal. Uh, we talk to development groups uh, all the time to try to show them our stuff and get them excited about maybe taking this into the next version of Visual Studio. Uh, so we're, we're in the middle of that kind of process right now. And is that how the, it typically works in Microsoft Research? I mean, you know, Andrew Bagels is sitting around and goes, you know, we should do this. You pitch it to your boss, he gives you some money, you pull it off, and then you go shop it around? Uh, almost. Um, I don't really need to pitch ideas to my boss or get money. I just do it. Wow. And then when we finish it, we usually pitch it around. Uh, we have a Tech Fest conference every year where we show off what Microsoft Research does to the rest of Microsoft to try to get them excited about the kinds of things that we do. And, and if they're in the product planning phase, they usually will come to us and say, I had this idea. I didn't know if it was doable, but I see your product. I want that. I didn't realize that you guys had that level of freedom as researchers. You can just work on whatever is the most interesting to you. Exactly. And aren't there researchers that are working on things that aren't interesting and they get feedback that this thing you're doing is boring? Not that I think you're doing something boring. Well, we have other ways to get evaluation other than product groups, which is academic papers and sort of if it's going to be innovative research work in the academic community, then that's enough value for us as well. Now, how long do you work on something like this before you decide that it's baked and you're going to move on to the next thing? This was a three-month project I did with an intern last fall, and uh, I spent the last month sort of jazzing it up for uh, PDC. But other than that, we haven't really worked on it that much. But it is leading into our next project, which we're currently working on back at Microsoft. Wow, that is an amazing amount of work in, in three months. Now, is this something that people can see at the research.microsoft.com site, or can we see movies about this information? Uh, they can see um, a web page that I wrote about it, and also I wrote an academic paper about it that they can download if they do go to research.microsoft.com. Um, the tool itself is not available for download uh, to the external community. Cool. Well, thank you so much, Andrew Bagel, a researcher at Microsoft Research, for talking to me today at PDC 2008. Thanks very much. Continuing to wander around the Microsoft Research booths here at PDC, at MSR at PDC, I've just come upon a project called Chess, and I'm speaking with Shaz Khadir, a researcher with Microsoft Research. So what is Chess and what are we looking at? Uh, chess is a tool that can help you find and reproduce in a systematic and deterministic fashion uh, bugs that we call Heisenbugs. So Heisenbugs, uh, the name comes from Heisenberg's uncertainty principle uh, from back in the 30s, where the idea was that if you observe a physical system, then you change its properties. So you're not actually observing the system. So these are the kinds of bugs that when you try to observe them to find their cause, the bugs just disappear into you. Now, was this the gentleman that said that you could tell where something was or how fast it was going, but, but not, not both? Not both. At the same time, exactly. That's right. I remember someone telling me that uh, Heisenberg got pulled over by the police one time, and the guy said, do you know how fast you're going? And he said, no, but I know exactly where I am. <laughs> that might very well be. <laughs> yeah. 
So I understand that by, uh, there's been a number of bugs that I've had where I'm debugging something and it just doesn't do the same thing in release mode. You know, while debugging it works one way, but otherwise it, it, it exactly. doesn't. So sometimes it works in the release mode uh, and doesn't work in the debug mode. But the, even the worst thing is that when it uh, does not work in the release mode and then you have to patch it and fix it and when you l- try to run it in the debug mode, the bug doesn't happen anymore and now you're stuck because you can't repro it. So how does chess make this easier? Ah, so the way chess makes this easier is that we have identified that the main cause of these kind of Heisenbergs is concurrency. So concurrency, another way to understand concurrency is that in a multiple, multi-threaded application, you have these threads running and their relative timing uh, causes problems. So sometimes one thread goes faster, sometimes another thread goes faster. And depending on which thread is going faster, you get different outcomes. So what chess can do is systematically generate all possible orders of events of the threads in your application. And when it does that systematically, it will eventually find, hopefully, uh, a particular execution order that causes a bug. And once it finds it, it remembers it. And the next time you run the application, it can repro that. Now, does this... Well, I like to, we all like to think that our programs are deterministic and they run the same way every time. Are these kinds of um, concurrency, out-of-ordering issues uh, an issue of the programmer doing things like inserting sleeps and expecting that uh, their stuff won't be preempted? Or is this just the nature of computing and a nature that we really didn't realize as programmers? It is a nature of uh, concurrent programs. When you write a concurrent program in which multiple threads are executing at the same time, uh, the runtime... Uh, does not guarantee you that a particular schedule will be taken. You have to somehow control the scheduling decisions by using synchronization, but that leaves room for still a huge number of possible schedules. The runtime can choose any one of them, and that's the real problem, because the runtime can choose any one of them, and it does not guarantee that the next time you run the program, it will choose the exact same schedule. So sometimes a buggy schedule is chosen. The next time you run it, that buggy schedule might not be chosen, and then you can reproduce the bug. So what, what does Chess do if I'm unit testing an application that is multi-threaded to make this, uh, this not a problem anymore? Sure. So what Chess will do is uh, it will run your uh, unit test uh, in a loop. And Chess inserts um, uh, what we like to think of as a user mode scheduler between the application and the underlying runtime. That user mode scheduler intercepts calls made to the underlying threading primitives And uh, that allows Chess to hijack the scheduling and control it. So every time Chess runs the application in a loop, it guarantees that a different thread schedule will be taken using this mechanism. Now, if I had a highly multi-threaded application, couldn't I get into a cross-product or Cartesian product situation where the the Chess has to pick uh, a really, really large number of ways that this could run, and it could take an hour or two to let me know all the different possibilities? Right. This is absolutely true. Uh, In fact, uh, there is this combinatorial explosion of the number of possibilities that happens as the number of threads and the number of steps performed by each thread increase. To give you an idea, if the number of uh, 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 threads is n, and the number of steps performed by each thread is k, then the total number of possibilities is exponential in both n and k. That is really large. Um, so, But what chess does is it uh, intelligently picks uh, these executions that it's trying to explore. And it has two different ways of combating this uh, combinatorial explosion. One is that oftentimes uh, uh, a schedule, once executed, is equivalent to many other possible schedules. Uh, that could be po- could, that could be executed, and chess recognizes that and just prunes them away. The second thing chess does is it prioritizes even among the schedules that it generates uh, those schedules that are more likely to yield bugs. So let me explain that a little bit more. We have observed that preemptions, uh, which are essentially unexpected context switches, are uh, a real problem in causing concurrency bugs. So what Chess does is uh, it says that it it works on this hypothesis that you need uh, to preempt at unexpected places to cause bugs, but you don't need too many such preemptions. So what you can do is you can tell Chess, give Chess a parameter that, okay, uh, bound the number of preemptions by, say, two. And then Chess will systematically generate schedules in which there are no more preemptions than two. 
So it, it, it investigates all possible plays for preempting, but does not have more than two preemptions. And this is very useful because um, uh, most, most, a lot of concurrency bugs that we have found, they just require uh, you know, one or two preemptions. And we have found bugs in large applications using this method. So let me see if I can paraphrase what you just said to make sure that I understand it. So now I understand why this is called chess, because you're making many moves ahead to see what's going to happen and then make the right move uh, sure. for the future. So in the first example, you're basically making, uh, I guess, the equivalent of, of, of a hash to say that exactly. this, this thread, uh, this preemption style and that preemption style, are, they really hash to the same thing. So by testing either of them, we have tested that, that scenario. Right. right. And then in the other example, you're in, in the next uh, way you're making up basically a bell curve and you're saying we're going to hit 80% of the errors of the errors in the lower half of the bell curve right exactly so then you can basically say how uh, exhaustively do we want to explore the problem space which is ultimately what chess systems like deep blue do they say you know i have a pretty good confidence of winning if i make this move i could probably keep going for another million years right. but i wouldn't necessarily change the statistical right. value of me winning that's exactly right so this is a very good analogy from the point of view of chess chess wins when it finds a bug so there are lots of strategies for finding bugs, right? A strategy is essentially a schedule that it can pick. And what chess is doing is in this astronomical space of schedules, it's trying to look for schedules that are more likely to yield bugs. And these are uh, schedules that have fewer preemptions. So what does this look like physically? I add a reference in my MS unit test application. Do I attribute things or uh, how do I get chess involved? Uh, it's actually very simple. If you have Visual Studio Team Test installed on your machine, then all you have to do is install chess also. And chess has... Uh, is incorpor chess can be then invoked by giving a host type attribute called chess to uh, your unit test. And is this acting as a profiler, or how are you injecting yourself into this process? Ah, so basically what happens is that when the DLL gets loaded into memory, uh, the, the, the DLL containing the unit test, uh, checks, chess hooks into it, and it does IL rewriting so that all the calls to the system.threading API, all the concurrency API, they get rerouted to chess wrappers. And the chess wrappers make callbacks to the chess user mode scheduler, and in addition, pass those calls uh, to the actual API. So where can people learn more about this, and uh, is this something that can be downloaded in a research form and, and played with at all? Uh, you can uh, get lots of information about chess uh, from the chess website. And... Uh, it's at, the, the website is research.microsoft.com slash projects slash chess. And I'll put links to that on the show site. Oh, that would be great. And the website contains a download of chess uh, for unmanaged code uh, and a whole bunch of uh, research papers and uh, PowerPoint presentations explaining uh, the chess system. In addition, um, the latest set of chess bits will be available via the DevLabs portal uh, in a few months. And uh, these bits will contain both unmanaged and managed chess, as well as the Visual Studio team test integration of uh, managed chess. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Shaz Khadir, a researcher from Microsoft Research, uh, for sharing chess with me and making concurrency uh, easier for the masses. Uh, you're welcome, Scott. Thanks for coming. Bye. Continuing to wander around here at MSR at PDC, and I've stumbled upon Jared Jackson, and I'm looking at a big flat screen monitor with a really beautiful view of, uh, of a map, of a topological map, and then I've got some, uh, what appears to be Windows workflow uh, workflows. Well, what am I looking at, Jared? So you're looking at two things. On, on the big screen, the map that you saw there is actually an application called Cove. It's, it's written by the University of Washington, who are a partner of ours. It works a lot like virtual Earth except that when you get to the ocean, it doesn't stay flat across the ocean. It'll actually go deep deep down and do what they call bathymetry, which is the, the topography only underneath the water. And what we've done is uh, at uh, Microsoft Research, is, which is on your other screen, is this product called Trident. And what it is is it's an interface into Windows workflow for scientists who are doing this research. So... Uh, what came out of the oceanography side of things here, and our partners over at the University of Washington and a project called Neptune, what they've done is they've taken a, a, a whole bunch of fiber optic cable and actually trenched it into the bottom of the ocean. And they go way out from the shore, and they're going all around the uh, Juan de Fuca plate that's just off the coast of Washington, and they're reading a bunch of values, uh, you know, heat, temperature, um, salinity, current, things like that, and they bring in all that data, and it represents quite a bit of data. Um, to these on-site, onshore data centers. Then they need to do computation on top of that so that they can get to an end-result data product. 
So these aren't developers, and this is why they're not using Visual Studio. These are researchers, that are, and you're trying to make it easier for them. Because this appears to be a Windows workflow, uh, you know, workflow, and you have the workflow designer, but the, uh, the IDE is vastly uh, simplified. This doesn't look like Visual Studio. So there's actually two tiers of people who do research in the research community. The researchers themselves, and then they tend to have postdocs and, uh, and grad students that are doing some of the grunt work behind the scenes. Well, that's all good and well for getting the coding done, but the researchers are not programmers. And they need to have an interface where they can take whatever the, the programmers have done and actually be able to not just run it, but, but to change things. Research is changing all the time. So they want to see a data product and then maybe make an adjustment to it. And by giving them this simplified interface, they can go in and just with some dragging and dropping and some double-clicking and typing, you know, they, they change the parameters all around and get a whole new da- data product out of it. And that really is the point in the story that the Windows Workflow team is saying, is that you might build an application that is largely complete, but that, that business logic in the middle might be changing as your business needs change. So that makes total sense why a researcher would want to use a visual workflow to, to, do, their, uh, to do their work. W- what is this workflow doing here? This particular one is it's the simplified version of, of one that's run over and over again on the oceanographic side. They read a file. It's, it's called NetCDF, the format is. Um, and NetCDF is, is to oceanographers like XML is to us developers. Um, they, they read that in. Then they do a processing step on it. And, and that can get really involved. In our demo here, all it does is it filters out some of the outlier values. And, and from that, they produce a new NetCDF file. That's the third step in our, in our particular workflow here. And uh, once that's done, you have a lot of options. Do you, do you publish it? Do you, you know, send it off to, uh, to this visualizer over here? Well, that's what we're doing. The very last step is called Cove Message. It sends a, a message to our v- underwater visualizer called Cove. It tells it that there's a new data product available, and it will visualize that. So can you run this right now and make something happen on the big screen here? We're looking at a map, a topographical map. It's a big, uh, big fault line there. I had no idea. That was floating right off the coast there. It's really quite interesting to see the, uh, the underlying surface of the the ocean i just don't think about uh this really is a planet that's uh, a bunch of different floating template uh, you know i've got a, a young a young child and his his skull has just come together and a doctor was telling me well it's really in eight parts that are floating around his brain and the earth seems to be the same way so you've just launched this workflow and it's popped up a little balloon help in the tray here and something is firing off some messages have appeared on the on the screen what's happening so what happened the workflow launched over here on one machine and the very last step after about uh, about a minute of processing was that it had a new file ready for it, and it sent a message to Cove saying that something was available. And we just had a window pop up that said, hey, I have a new data set available. Do you want to load it? And so it looks like it says model file for Monterey, so you're doing something off the coast of Monterey, and there's a big fault line there, so we're processing that information. It says completed. I'm going to load that model file for Monterey Bay and see what happens. So this is all very friendly. The, uh, the researcher's not looking at any kind of code. There's nothing textual here. They're not really sweating any of the details. So while we're waiting for the progress bar here, I'm just, I'm just thinking that this really is kind of the whole point of Windows Workflow. You might create an application that is almost a little development environment, but it's specific to the business. In this case, the business of research is uh, what we're trying to accomplish. Uh, you find that the researchers really understand what they're, this visualization Right. This is a little bit separate than the visualization that you'll happen to see in, in, say, if you opened up a workflow in the Visual Studio Designer. And one of the big differentiators is the fact that data is a first-class visualization inside of this. Uh, Researchers are very concerned about what happens to their data every step of the way. And we visualize that directly inside of Trident. This reminds me of applications like Yahoo Pipes where uh, they're hiding an entire programming language around just moving data from one process to another, and all you ever think about is data. There's all sorts of control flow things, but ultimately they're just trying to filter or sort or, or modify. Yeah, you could argue that in Windows Workflow, control flow is the number one uh, artifact for how everything gets executed. From our point of view, data, data flow is the number one thing. Control flow is still important, but it's probably second seat to the flow of the data itself. Now, did you have to write your own kind of owner draw or a custom uh, representation of what a workflow is? So this is this is an entirely custom WPF application, as well as the designer surface itself? Yeah, we did. Uh, this is based on Windows Workflow 3.5, what you're seeing here. And so it was actually less code to write a WPF app that, that would look into the workflow and then redesign it all. Uh, from our understanding and what we've seen in w- WF 4.0, when that starts coming out, we can probably re-host the designer that's there. 
Well, this is a fairly simple workflow with four boxes and inputs and outputs. Can you drill into this and look at the other nodes, or what are these nodes that don't have lines connecting them? I can see here that name, you know, file name goes to file name, and input goes to output, but uh, can you drill in at all? Sure. So if you see a line between the output of one activity and the input of another, that means there's a data binding. So the result of that, the output from the first activity will be the input for the for the other one. But you can set things just like you would uh, like in a, in the parameters of a of a method. So if you double click on an input, for instance, it'll bring up a, a dialog with a box where you can actually enter in the value as a, as a literal as opposed to something that's bound. Every one of the, and every one of those are, is is set up to do that. And these solid ones, in fact, there's there's a there's a key. These are color coded, and there's a key you can drop down to find out what the types are of all the inputs and outputs. So that helps you match which which ones would link together. And on top of that, there's a sense of required inputs and optional inputs. So if, if it looks filled in like you'll see on the input for a processing step, you have to have that data. These other two are optional. Interesting. Then when you pulled down the list of data types, you had things that I recognized like string and int, and then you had hypercube. Yeah. Uh, string, int, and hypercube, not exactly the three top data t- types that I'm using. Well, string and int certainly is way up there. Hypercube is something that's uh, it's very specific to and uh, anybody who's into computation in the scientific realm would understand it. It's a four-dimensional uh, table, basically. So this is a hypercube like the kind that uh, I would think about. It's, it's, it's a cube, but then you add another dimension, and then it becomes hard to visualize. Right, I, it is. And so it, in the scientist's sense, it's X, Y, Z, and T, right? So it's, it's three-dimensional space plus a time series. I think that X, Y you get in high school, Z you get when you go to college, and then nobody gets T until they get a, a PhD. Right, well, does anybody really understand time? Yeah. Well, hopefully the guys at Microsoft Research do, because I sure don't with my uh, community college education. So it looks like our uh, progress bar here is at 98%, and it's marching on. And then what are we about to up 98? What are we going to see here on our giant, uh, our giant map? Well, I'd hate to ruin the surprise, but I think we're probably going to zoom in to Monterey Bay oh, wow. and see some temperature values. So we just had a heat map appear, and we zoomed in on Monterey Bay, and there's a lot of information here. It's a heat map because we can see that the water is one temperature here and another temperature there, but there's also depth. And what else are we looking at? It's actually also a time series, so it'll animate if we click right here. And you have to look kind of closely, but you'll see as as the time goes on, you can see the time scale in the in the bottom corner, and then the colors actually animate and show you where when it's getting hotter and when it's getting colder. Interesting, you know, it's it's got this um, reminds me of those things you see at the sharper image where it's a a plane that's filled with nails, and then you put your hand on it and it pushes some of the nails up and some of them down. So you've got not just heat and time, and depth, but temperature at depth. So there's a lot of information being displayed there, which explains why it took so long to, uh, to load up. Yep. Across a network, e- even, you know. So this is real data. This wasn't canned. You really brought this down from the University of Washington. Yeah, even sh- you can, if you want to have any question about that, you go to the first activity, look what the input happens to be. Yeah, it's coming from some Skyline server at the University of Washington. This is actually Monterey Bay uh, data from, I think, 2005, actually. Wow, so he's just double-clicked on uh, on the uh, workflow here, brought up a file name, and it's just a straight HTTP address, so you're pulling this directly from uh, from their web, their web server. Absolutely. Cool. Well, thank you so much, Jared Jackson, for taking the time to talk to me here at uh, Microsoft Research at PDC. Thank you. Thank you.